So just go ahead and invite Trey to come on up. Let's give him a hand. Really excited for what the Lord is going to speak to us. Thank you, Pastor Bill. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I'm very excited about Tuesday nights coming up. Uh, God put something on my heart uh, dearly and deeply. And uh, Tuesdays kind of be a little bit of that. And uh, I think that uh, the college age especially is, is underserved um, here. And I, I think it's one way that they can feel served. And I've already got a huge response from a lot of uh, college age individuals who are very excited to have an outlet. And like we, like he said, I mean, we're, this is going to be a rock show where our goal is to, it to be loud and to draw people in, in a different way. And, uh, you know, I believe that God has so many different types of teachers. I say, I tell Pastor Bill all the time, I, one of my favorite things is how many different individuals get up here and speak here. It shows the diversity that God has in his people. It shows the different types of teaching. And we all learn differently. And so to me, it's amazing to have another way for us to give back to the community. So there'll be a lot more about Tuesday night coming up. Um, But I also wanted to talk a little bit about Friday, last Friday. We have our Youth Connect every Friday. And uh, we actually, we didn't, I didn't get the pictures up here, but uh, we did have a bonfire um, at uh, some of the youth's house or ranch. It, it was really an incredible time. And honestly, like, I, I just kind of, you know, didn't plan too much. And, and God did some things. There was one of the most beautiful sunsets I've seen in a very long time that God gave to us that day. It was raining in the morning. It was wet and muddy. And the, the mom of of the family that, that kind of gave their house that night was like, oh, I don't know if, if we can do this tonight. And then I said, well, let's keep praying. Let's keep praying. And I'd been praying all week. The weather would be beautiful. And the, the clouds parted and it was clear as a bell. You could see uh, Venus and Saturn. And Mel was out there actually telling everybody, okay, this is this star and this is this star. And it was such an incredible time of worship and prayer and God heard the youth cry out, but he also saw the joy and love they gave to one another. So I just want to let you know, we appreciate everything you're doing for them because it is actually making connections in their lives and it's making changes in their lives. And truly God is moving in the youth here, uh, not just today, but I mean, honestly, going forward, I am excited about what he's about to do. So continuing to do. Um, so to the word today, we're going to be in Matthew, I put it up there for you, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Now, if you know Matthew chapter 5, you know it's what? The Beatitudes, yes, yes, Sermon on the Mount, beginning, the Beatitudes. I'm not going to really focus that much. If you see, we're starting in verse 10, it's kind of the end of the Beatitudes, but I want to pray and then we're going to enter the time in the word. Lord, Thank you so much for just allowing us to have this space to be able to worship you, to have this space to talk about you, to have this space to share what you've done in our lives, Lord, where others are being persecuted all over the world and tortured and terrible things happening. We can freely worship you. This is to be blessed, Lord, by you. And I just thank you for that. And I just pray that your spirit would move in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is starting to deliver the Sermon on the Mount. And I love this as he's going through all these blessings. And uh, one of my favorite pastor teachers I, I grew up with always would read it. And he would say, Oh, how happy are the poor in spirit. Oh, how happy are those who mourn. Oh, how happy are those that are meek. And I love this This. Oh, how happy, which is like the literal translation of blessed. You know, we think of blessed as this thing that happens to us, but a lot of ways it's our mind and who we are and how we relate to the situation. Oh, how happy. I have this uh, gentleman that's working for me right now, and he's gone through a lot in his life. Uh, he, drug abuse was a huge part of his life, and, and he's overcome that. He's, he's overcome so many bad situations in his life. And he said to me, you know, I, I, I just know I just got to gotta keep my eyes on God, and I got to keep my eyes on the right situation because it's God giving me the right mental space. 
It's God pointing me to happiness. And I said, man, you're blessed. And he said, well, I don't know if blessed is the word. And I said, but you're, I said, are you happy? He's like, I have to be. (laughs) He's like, if I'm not happy with my every day and I look at all the bad things, I won't be blessed. I said that that is happiness. It's realizing what God has brought us through and focusing on the amazing blessings, the happiness that he's providing our life. Happiness isn't about just everything being I'm rich and I got everything I want. It's about realizing where we've come from and where we are. And so as we look at verse 10, I want you to think about that. And it says, blessed or oh, how happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We, a lot of the times we go, oh, if you're persecuted, you're going to be blessed. Not in the way you think about it. I mean, it's not going to be comfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be distressing. It's going to be hard. Being persecuted is not easy. No one likes being told they're wrong. No one likes being told you're a fool, you're crazy. You believe that religious stuff? That's crazy. No one likes hearing that. No one wants their Bible taken from them and put into prison because they read a Bible, because they had a Bible, because they spoke the name of the Jesus on the street. The context of being blessed is important here. Oh, how happy are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. God's not promising that our life is going to be joyful in in this physical realm. He's promising us forever. He's promising us something greater, righteousness sake. It's about those around you. Bill's talking about connections, creating those, these connection points. Persecution brings righteousness. Not to you. This is for believers. You've already had that. You've already believed in Jesus. You've already accepted Jesus. That's why you're being persecuted. You're being persecuted for the kingdom. When Jesus is giving this to the disciples, this Beatitudes, it's to them. He's speaking directly to disciples. If you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus, if you consider yourself an apostle, someone that goes forward to spread his word, this is for you. Oh, how happy you are if you're persecuted. Blessed, truly blessed to be persecuted. In verse 11, he says, Blessed are those when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things falsely against you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad when they persecute you, when they spit on you, when they tell you you're a fool. Be happy. This is what God intends in our lives. He wants us to rejoice in the hardship. He wants us to rejoice. David rejoiced as Saul sook to kill him. He came after him and we read psalm after psalm. David saying, Lord, save me, but I still praise you. And you're still the Lord of all. And I love you. It's like, man, I, I, I don't know. If I was being hunted to be murdered, I don't know how happy I could be. I'd probably be pretty paranoid. Like, whoa. Whoa. You know, I I don't know if I could be comfortable in any one place or at any time. I don't know if I could have a pillow to lay on to feel comfort. You'd lay on rocks just so you'd be ready to jump at any time. But he was happy. Why? Because he knew that God was doing something great in the persecution. He knew God was doing something incredible. Didn't mean he didn't have a sorrowful spirit at times. Didn't mean that he didn't mourn what was going on. But he recognized that God had so much more. And he did. He became king. He was able to to instrument, you know, what his son would end up doing and building the temple. God used his suffering and his persecution for something so much greater. So much greater than anything that he could think. 
I want to share a story with you. I know that you probably look at the message notes and you're like, don't widen the plate. What does that mean? Well, I heard this teaching by this gentleman, and he was a, he's not a pastor, not a teacher, a believer, absolutely. He was a baseball professional, and I say that because he was a hitting coach, he was a pitching coach, he was one of the best. Uh, he's passed, un- unfortunately, and he was giving a speech in 1996, and, and I got to hear this on recording, and it was an incredible speech. Uh, a friend of mine played it to me, and I wrote it, I, I, I got a... Um, a synopsis of it, and I've always kept it on me in some way with phone. Of course, that's really easy. I had it in my Bible before because I thought it was a really good reminder to us about our job in this world and who we are ought to be and how we ought to kind of walk. And so he gives this message, and he did this in Nashville, Tennessee. There's about 4,000 people that heard this speech when he gave it. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's crazy. He went on for like an hour. But I kind of made some like footnotes for you so that we're not going to just do that the whole time. But I think some of the really important things that he did in this speech, and his name was John Scolios. And he was an incredible, incredible recognizer of talent. And so these coaches and these professionals were there to hear from him. They wanted to hear what this professional man had to say about baseball. How many baseball fans we have? Okay, we got a few. Okay, so here's my question to you. Gentlemen that raise their hands, or anybody that might know the answer to this question, how many inches is the home plate in Little League? Does anybody know? It's 17. 17 inches. Okay, when you go into high school baseball, how many inches is the home plate? Does anybody know? 17. When you go into college, how many inches is the home plate? 17. When you go into AAA baseball, how many inches is the home plate? Yeah, you all know the answer now. 17. When you're a major league baseball player, how many inches the professionals is the home plate? It's 17 inches. You get me, right? It never changes. There is a standard that is set by this. And he goes on a little bit about this. But where I wanted to, to kind of go is he, 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 he talks about the plate being 17 inches. And he says to his, him, 17 inches, he confirmed with a bellowing voice. And what do they do? when a big league pitcher who can't throw over that 17 inches, and everybody starts shouting in the audience, and you can hear it on the tape, they send him to Pochella, which is the minor leagues. They send them down. If they can't throw over the pitch, if they can't throw that baseball over the plate, they send them down. If they cannot throw a strike over the plate, they're not good enough. They can't be in the major leagues. They can't do it. What they don't do is say, let's widen the plate. Let's change the standard for Jimmy. He is the one that deserves a 24-inch plate. Oh, Tommy can't hit the baseball over the plate? Let's make it 25 inches for him. That'll let him hit. He goes on to say, when your best player shows up late for the game, for practice... Do you let him play? Well, it's okay, you know, because John is our best pitcher. And if he doesn't pitch tonight, we can't win. They don't. Major League Baseball teams can't do that. Why? Because the standards get lowered. And with lower standards, they're no longer professionals. When we lower the standards of what is the requirement to be a professional athlete, there are no professionals. In the world right now, they're telling us, you know, oh, you know, uh, trans athletes can be a part of women's sports. 
They're widening the plate in such an unfair way. Why? Because they want to be inclusive, because they want everybody to feel fit in. But when you go to a major league park or you go to an NBA, they don't lower the hoop for them. You have to get to this particular pinnacle. You have to be exactly that. And because of that, we love to watch NFL football because the guy can throw a spiral that's perfect into a guy's arms from 70 yards down the field. We love it because there's greatness in there. There's greatness in standards. There's greatness in perfection. There's greatness in not deluding and saying things are okay. I want you to understand something very important. We are persecuted as Christians because we see the standard of God. I was talking to someone the other day, and they were talking about the commandments. And they're like, well, you know, the commandments have passed. You know, Jesus has, has freed us from them, and they're no longer a burden on us. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's true, but, I mean, it, you know, we, we should still probably follow them, though. I think that that's a good thing. I think God said we shouldn't murder for a reason. I mean, we shouldn't just pretend like that didn't exist. You know, God said, you know, don't commit adultery, for a reason. I mean, it is important that we still look at the commandments and go, there's a standard there. There's a recognition that God set up a standard. But I see these churches that just want you to feel good. They want you to come in and they tell you everything's great. I, I remember me and my wife went to this church and they were serving in and out. And this is in California, so I know all the Whataburger fans are here like, now oh, in and out. But in California, In-N-Out is like the Whataburger of Texas, so we'll just say that. And I remember all these people lining up to go get In-N-Out at the, the church, and the church was packed, free In-N-Out. What? I can't believe this. This is amazing, right? And then the pastor gets up there and then basically just tells everybody they're wonderful, that he loves them, that they're great Christians. Go have In-N-Out. And everybody's like, yay, good worship, good message. And I'm like, that wasn't a good message. There was no standard set. There was nothing about pursuit of holiness. There was nothing about anything that had to do with a Christian life. It was a lie. We are lying to our people to fill a church. I stayed at Live Springs the first time I was here because Pastor Bill spoke the truth. Even if it hurt, even if it singes my heart, my frail ego, it hurt. And that was good. And I stayed because I know that is what God does with us. When we were at the bonfire, I read Malachi to the to youth. In Malachi, it talks about how God is a refining fire in our lives. Gold is pure because it has been burned down over and over and over and over again. And every time it's burned, God, or the refiner in this case, takes the impurities off the top and he gets them. And you'd think it'd be pure after that first burn, but it's not, right? There's a huge difference between, you know, 2K gold and 24 karat, right? It's how many times it's been refined. It's how many times those impurities have been stripped away. Our lives are like God's refining fire. But if there's no standard, if there's no commandments, if there's no speaking the truth to one another, we will never hit those standards and we will never be refined in the spirit of God. A church that just says the things that people want to hear is not a church that is truly being refined for God's work. There's not true laborers coming from that. 
The real message of Christ is not being said. Oh, happy are those, or, oh, happy are you when they revile and persecute you. Well, I can't say that because if I say that, then they'll hate me. Jesus was hated, hated to death. They hated him because of the words he spoke. And they killed him because of it. Stephen was hated because he shared of Jesus. They hated him to death and stoned him because he said the name of Jesus and called him the Son of God, called him the Messiah, and they killed him for it. As Stephen was dying, he looked up and saw God. Why? Because that was what God wanted for his life. That was a happy moment for Stephen. You can only imagine what God pain de he delivered of him in, in that moment and what God did for him as he stared up to heaven. Persecution is important. Why did I share the story of the plate? Because we cannot lower the standards of the church for any reason. We can't lower the standards of God's calling for any reason. And why? Well, he goes on in verse 13 here. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. I love salt. Who loves salt? Salt's the best. Claire, my daughter, is obsessed with salt. Almost too much. We joke all the time she's going to burn out her kidneys because she uses so much salt on everything. Salt's amazing. Salt does so much for us as people. There was a period of time, I know this is going to shock a lot of you that haven't, don't know anything about this. We used to not have refrigerators, and the only way they could preserve food was with salt. That's it. They, they just salt it a lot. Because it takes the oxygen out, and it preserves that meat so it can be eaten later. Salt cleans water. How many people have a salt water filtration system in their house? I know I do. It's amazing, right? And the water's clean and you feel really good. There's, you know, we get, a, we get a little bit of notice that's like, hey, you should be boiling your water right now. And we're like, cool, we got this awesome salt filtration system that's supposed to take all these contaminants out. Awesome. I load up the salt like every quarter, get like three 40-pound bags in there. It's, it's good to go. It smells like strong salt, right? It's, it's kind of oppressive and embracive, right? When salt gets in a wound, it cleans, but it also does what? It hurts. It's painful. I love one of the definitions. There's a lot of definitions of for salt, um, but one particular one that I really like is uh, as, a, as a thing that salt does. Salt is required, and this is a, from a scientific journal. The salt in the human body is required to conduct nerve impulses and contract and reflect muscles and maintain the proper balance of water and minerals in the body. Proper balance. So Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. If we, the salt, have no standards and we have lost and we've widened that plate and we don't give the truth to one another and we don't rub the salt in the wound, we've lost all seasoning and we fail to maintain the proper balance. And what am I talking about? Well, let's look at America right now. We were a nation that was built on God. And now we're feeling like we're a nation built on Satan. More and more and more. And that is what they're pushing to. It's because we are not being the salt of the earth in this country. We are not getting out there and properly balanced. We are okay to be pushed away when someone doesn't like what we're saying. 
We're okay that, oh, well, I don't offend anybody. We're okay with that. That is not how salt works. It gets in there. It hurts. It's abrasive. But it balances. It preserves life. That is who we ought to be. That is our job. It's better to have a church that is constantly in that place of salt and light than a church that has lost its seasoning, that is no longer in that place. It doesn't matter how many people. A few people can make the difference. A few well-equipped Believers in Christ make all the difference. How many of you went out, and I hope you did, and saw the Jesus Revolution? Okay, so we have a few out here. I just want to say, like, one, you should go see it. One, because you should support when amazing movies about Jesus are made, and it's an incredible movie. Because it's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. They say Jesus' name like 70 plus time in the movie. I mean, it's just all over. And it depicts true relationship in Christ. My pastor I grew up with is one of the three leading figures in it that are, that are, that are part of the movie. And it was a joy to me to see such a beautiful walk that they started. But it was a couple individuals that exploded, absolutely exploded a movement out of California that absolutely changed that entire area. I don't know if I would be standing before you in the way that I am had that movement not happened. My dad was affected by that movement. My mom was affected by that movement. I was affected by that movement because a couple men, because a couple individuals said, you know what, let's love the hippies. <laughs> Who, who cares what they're doing? Let's bring the message to them. My favorite scene in the movie is that everybody, the parishioners at the church, start getting mad at him because they all have muddy feet because they're walking in barefoot. And I remember he always told this story. When I was in college, he told this story to us. And he said, yeah, I, I, uh, they were complaining about the carpet getting dirty, so I decided that I would wash the feet of all the hippies when they were coming in the building. And so he stood at the entrance of the chapel. And it wasn't a very big chapel. But he stood at the entrance. And every person that was in bare feet, he washed their feet. Because he, it didn't matter how they got in there. It was a matter of getting the salt to them. It was a matter of getting the message to them. It is important that we recognize that we have the power as individuals to influence the entire nation. I know for me, I can't wait. I have to move. God is putting it in my heart and soul. And it hurts if I am not moving and I am not pursuing him and I am not telling people about Jesus. It hurts me. I can't. I go even like a week without sharing the word and it starts to just cripple me because I just have to talk. And so I just find random people to talk to Christ about because I just have to get it out. And I'm like, this feels good. I'm going to keep doing this. And it feels good. And I got to because God's put it in my heart. It's who I am because of him, because of his refinement, because I'm allowing him to dig deep and to take out all the gross and sick things that are of me and put him in there. He's getting that out. He's erasing it. And I praise him for the changes he's made in me. I can't wait to see what it looks like in 10 years. I can't wait to see what I look like in 20 years. I look forward to getting older in Christ because I am getting closer and closer to him. But in the meantime, it's my job because I'm one of his soldiers it is my job to go out and to tell everyone about him. It's my job to be the salt of the earth. If you believe, and I believe everyone in here does, believe in Christ, it is your job 
is your good and faithful service. Because you love him. Because he already forgave you. None of what you're doing is doing anything to prevent that. You don't have to do anything. If you don't do anything, your salvation, not affected. But are you being effective to the calling of God? Are you tackling the things God puts before you? When I think about standards that we set for our life, it was funny, when I, when I grew up, I know my mom's watching, so she'll get a kick out of this. My mom is an incredible shoot, like in basketball, she can shoot so well. So she liked playing this game called Around the World. If you've ever played Around the World, and she was so good at all the shots. And you kind of go around the outside of the key, and you make a shot at a time and a shot at a time. And I remember being like, I don't know, like seven or eight, and she'd whoop me. She'd whoop me, like, she'd whoop me and my brother. And years and years and years went by. I remember my brother's in high school, and she's still beating him. She's still beating him. But I was taking basketball serious, and I started beating my mom here and there. She's still an incredible shooter. And still, even at 18, she could still get out there, and she just was so consistent. And I remember my mom telling me, and, and someone said, you just, you just always beat him. It didn't matter what age. And she said, yeah. They got to know what standard they got to raise to. They got to know that I'm going to beat them. And they got to know how good they got to be to actually be able to beat me. And they're not going to do that if I'm not making shots. They're not going to do that if I let easy on them. I'm going to beat them. And I remember when my nephews were growing up, a couple of people were like, why do you always beat them so bad? I'm like, actually, it could be worse. But I do do that because I'm teaching them. My mom taught me this. I'm teaching them that. You, you, you go and you run to win the race. You don't let up because people are falling behind. You show what, how fast you have to run. You show how hard you have to run, how hard you have to work, the things you have to do to get it accomplished. Um, someone said to me the other night, like, wait, you already did everything? And I said, yeah. And they go, why didn't you wait for everybody else? I can't wait for everybody else. If I wait for everybody else to catch up, God's work isn't being done. Stop waiting. God will do amazing things with you if you stop waiting. Whatever it is, whatever God's put in your heart to do, do it. Stop waiting. I don't know what you're waiting for. There's not going to be some ray of light and God's like, oh, and he's going to like, you're going to be like, oh, now I know it's the right thing to do. Stop waiting. Who knows? Pastor Bill always says, if God's in it, it's going to succeed. I agree. Stop waiting for others to catch up. God has a calling for you. Run. Do the thing. This life is about us being salt and light and us moving forward. It's not about us waiting for everyone to catch up. And I'll tell you this. If you run, those around you will be inspired by you running. And they will start to run. Not everyone. But when you start to work hard for God, when you start putting everything into it, others around you, they'll get better. They'll start being able to make the baskets and, and beat your mother at basketball. <laughs> you will get better because you're running. I don't know what I'm doing half the time with the youth. I really don't. I just go, Lord... What are we doing? And, and God's like, I don't know. What do you want to do? And I'm like, well, you know, I got these thoughts. And then Caden's like, oh, let's do the, this and this. I'm like, oh, that sounds good, actually. Okay, that's, that's good. We can make it work. And we go do it. Right? We, just, we just go do things. And then we pray for God's blessing upon him. We pray for his anointing. And things happen. And the ministry goes forward. Trust me, if I had to wait for God to tell me what to do, the youth ministry would still be sitting with like five or six of us in a room. And, and God's brought all this youth. We had like 25 youth over at a barbecue, or sorry, sorry, a bonfire on Friday because God is bringing such blessings because me and Caden are just running. 
It's not about what you know how to do. God just wants you to move. He wants you to stop pretending like you can't. Because the truth is none of us can without him. We can't. I can't. I need Jesus. I need his presence. I need his spirit. I can't. The other side of that, he says, you in verse 14, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill. And it cannot be hidden. I was looking up, I had this really interesting I thought about lighthouses. Um, I don't know if there's any lighthouse experts in the audience, but um, currently active in the United States, which actually blew my mind, there are over 779 active lighthouses that are registered in the U.S. database right now. And on average, these lighthouses save over 150,000 lives a year. And they think that's an underestimate, but based on reportings. How many people didn't even report that the lighthouse saved them that are not on there? The lighthouse is this beacon, and now they're all automated nowadays. There's really not really any, you know, you see always the movies where there's the old man that's flipping on the light. That really doesn't happen anymore, but that, of course, did happen at some point. But we're in this automated age, but the lighthouse is still needed. All the technology, we have all these things that we've gone on. We have these amazing floodlights on these boats. They still need the lighthouse. They need to see the light. The world needs to see the light of Christ. You that believe in Christ are that light. And if you hide yourself in your house, I'm not good enough. I can't get out there and do that. Lives will be lost. Why? Because we're not going out there and we're getting the word of God out there. This nation needs us as salt and light. Whatever issues you have with the government, you are the salt and the light. It starts with your ability to get out there and do something. We need people everywhere, and even in government, but we need Christians everywhere, in schools. We need Christians at the grocery store, managing, influencing. I had this, uh, this uh, woman that works for me. I do, uh, I do, I'm a district manager for a trash company, just plain and simple. And uh, I have this woman that works for me, and she quit the other day, just... She just quit. And it was, it was upsetting, but for me it wasn't upsetting because she quit. Because I can, I can find other people. It's not like, I, I can hire other people. You know, the, the, the work will go on. She wasn't essential to the business. But I messaged her back, because she text messaged me, she quit, the day before she's got to work. And I said, you know what? I said, I want you to really think about what you're doing right now. I know that this job's important to you, and I know that this is helping pay for your life. And you don't mean what you're saying right now. And God just put it in my heart, and I said, you're pushing people away that want to help you. They're, they're bringing out a hand to you, and even if you don't like the message, you're still pushing people away that want to help you. Let me help you. Stop pushing me away. I said, if you call me tomorrow, I'll know. And she calls me in the morning, and she's like, the first thing I hear her voice, and it's like cracking, and she's like weeping. And she's like, I'm sorry. And I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, stop. You called me. It's done. Like, it's okay. And she said, she's in her 50s, and she said, no man has shown this kind of love and grace to me in my life. And I don't trust men. And I just thought you were just like all the other ones. And I said, well, I was. <laughs> I said, but Jesus Christ came in my life. And he changed who I am. And you are a child of God. And you are important to him. And I want you to continue to work because you are important to him. And your life's important to him. And she said, I don't know a lot about what you're saying. But she's like, but I want to hear more. God has put me in a position in the world to be an influence. I could, oh, I don't want to bring up God right now. You know, that would be really bad. 
Why? Because I'm going to be, what, is she going to say I'm foolish? She's going to say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about? Or am I going to be able to have an opportunity to share Christ in someone's life? The message is simple, but the gift is immeasurable. You are the salt and the light of this earth. In verse 17, it says, Do not think that I came, Jesus still speaking, to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill them. He was the fulfillment of everything. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, one tittle, which is like the little exclamation points in in, in the writing. Uh, Not one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled, all till the end of time, not any of it. Whoever shall be called in the least of the kingdom, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse, 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches, teaches men so... Teaches men so, and this is really one point on this, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. He is saying that we are the salt and the light, and in the next passage, he's saying, you need to teach them the commandments. It is important that they understand, just because I fulfilled it, does not mean it's not important, does not mean these standards. We are the salt and light for a reason. We help purify God wants to use you to help purify. And it's not your message, it's his fulfillment. But we are his body, the proper balance of water and minerals. We are the balance. I believe an absolute coming to Christ, revolution, revival is on this way. It's something that me and Pastor Bill both believe Mildly, I don't think this nation is even close to done if, if we seek God and we put him first in everything. If we get back to being salt and light and we stop diluting the word of God, we stop downplaying the things God has for us and we embrace his message and we, we stop saying it's okay. Oh, there's more than two genders. No, it's not okay. God made us man and woman. It is not okay to abort a child. God said, go forth and multiply. Be fruitful. One of the first things he told us to do. It's not okay. It's not. Stop giving them that. Stop allowing it to be okay. Stand up and say it's not okay. Stand up and be the light and the salt of this earth. Oh, how happy are you when they revile and persecute you. Blessed. Two things I want to encourage you today. One, One, give thanks to God when someone comes against you when you share about Jesus. When you bring up the spiritual world, when you talk about Jesus, when you talk about the spirit and someone is offended by it, it's a good moment. Oh, how happy you ought to be when you're persecuted or reviled And it's really probably not even that bad, honestly. It's probably just like, I disagree with you. Awesome. Let's go. Let's talk. I want to talk to you. Let's debate. Let's have some good discourse. Let's get that salt in the wound. It's important. Have that. Have that discord. Have it in your life. Make it something meaningful. To raise the standards and try to look at God's standards. We're not perfect. You're never going to be perfect. I'm not saying that you need to be perfect. I believe the pursuit of perfection is what God wants for us, but it's impossible. And God knows that. He knows you. He knows your heart. How about we just take it one refining fire at a time? 
Let's take it one fire at a time, one cleansing, one impurity. I think we're so quick in our lives to be like, okay, i got to get everything out right now, and then I'm going to be ready for God. Like everything. Like, okay, okay, and this is a sin, this is a sin, this is a sin, this is a sin. And, and then we overload ourselves, and then people just give up because they're like, oh, I'm not going to do it. Let God refine you one fire at a time. Let the thing, whatever God has in you, just, just let him take it. Whatever he's like, hey, this is the thing. Let him take it from you. Let him refine that. He'll get to everything, trust me. He'll get to it as you walk with Christ in your life. It is not yours to take away, it's his. He just asks that you have the desire for it. He asks that you have the de desire to just say, Lord, come take these things from me. Lord, use me. And I, I tell you this, when you start being used by God in the world because you move, because you move, because you choose to walk with your feet and you move towards service in God, when you start to do that, he'll refine you. He'll, he'll take it. Honestly, you stop even really realizing that he's doing it because you're moving. He was too busy. Marathon runners, when they're like at the end of the race, don't even realize what has happened to their body. Like they are decimated. Their entire body, uh, one of my bosses is a marathon runner and he said the last marathon he ran, he was like, man, on my like 20 second mile, I was like dead, but I don't remember that. <laughs> you know, he goes, because you're in the rhythm. Like my body was dying, but I was still running. <laughs> Things, you know, and not until you stop running do you realize what has happened. Our lives are a lot like that, in the good way, but... We run, and you'll look back at some point and go, man, God, you did so much. I didn't even realize you were doing it, and it was because we were running, because we were active, because we were pursuing. Be active. Don't just sit and listen. Be active. It doesn't matter if you're in high school or you're like, I'm almost dead. I don't want to do this. I remember my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, saying he was like 91, and it was his last message, and then he died the following week. And he said, I will not stop teaching. I will not stop giving the word of God until God has taken the very last breath from me. And I pray God gives me the ability to do the same in my life. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you make us people of movement, you make us people that are going to be salt and light, that you make us people that will not widen the plate for others, but we will keep God's standards and we will pursue these things in our lives, that our schools, that our government, that the, the, the places we work around us, anything that's affected by the world, the high schools, the colleges, they will be affected by us in such a mighty way, Lord, that you, you alone would make great, great revolution in us, that a revival would spur out and that Liberty Hill would, would be known as a focal place where revolution began, Lord. I pray that your touching and anointing of your spirit would pass through here and that every single person that heard today would be inspired by you, Lord, and you alone, and that you would have them move. Father, thank you and keep us today and just thank you for all your blessings. Oh, happy Oh, how happy we are, Lord, that we were able to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much.